Hey, you guys, it's fun drive time again at the Institute. Help me pay my writers. The Institute is awesome. You don't need convincing by me. You just need the address. LibertarianInstitute.org slash donate. Check out all the great kickbacks, including our latest book, Israel, winner of the 2003 Iraq Oil War by Gary Vogler. And we've got $10,000 in matching funds, so you can double your support without even trying. And William Van Wagenen's Syria book is almost done, too. It's so good. Just you wait. But it does take resources to edit and publish these books. So your help is greatly appreciated. I'm working on Provoked every day, I promise. LibertarianInstitute.org slash donate. And thanks, y'all. All right, y'all. Welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there, and the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com. Flash Scott Horton Show. All right, you guys, on the line, I've got Jeremy R. Hammond, and he is now a research fellow at the Libertarian Institute, I'm very proud to say. Of course, as you all know, he is the Libertarian Movement's foremost expert on the Israel-Palestine conflict, having authored the book Obstacle to Peace, which is right up there with the best of them anyone ever wrote, explaining the uh, controversy about Israel-Palestine there, and maybe better. So uh, very happy to have you here. Welcome back to the show. Jeremy, how are you doing? Thanks, Scott. Doing well. Uh, good, good. So you wrote this piece, ICJ declares Israel's occupation illegal. And, you know, uh, pardon me, suffer through this for me a bit here. Um, I'm conflicted, and I got to disclaim that I'm just against world government and even slight forms and the whole post-World War II order led by the UN and all of its little adjunct agencies that mostly serve as a fig leaf for the American empire anyway. Um, and yet, obviously, it's still important what they say, uh, how binding it is. I don't know. We can debate. We can talk about that. The UN charter has been ratified by the U.S. Senate. It is the law. The U.S. certainly uses the UN against everybody else. Uh, so there's a, you know, obvious kind of question about whether it's a rule of law at all, whether it ought to apply to America and its allies and all that. So these things are complicated and I don't take it for granted that, oh, like some ICJ says something. On the other hand, I'm very interested about what they say and especially on this very important issue where there's so much at stake and where they're clearly not clowning around. And this is, uh, you know, very important judicial rulings going on here you know, to what effect they have is also a separate question. But um, so I just have to disclaim that a little bit at the beginning because I'm just pretty right wing on the UN when it comes down to it from leftover from my old days. But, um, you know, anyway, that being said, ICJ declares Israel's occupation illegal. Well, what occupation is that? And, and tell us about this ruling. Sure. Well, uh, you know, just along the lines of, of your your little caveat there, um, yeah, I kind of I view things pretty much the same way. In fact, I, I might want to make the point uh, to preface uh, that the UN has great responsibility for creating and causing the Israel-Palestine conflict in the first place, which is kind of a topic for another discussion. Too shame. <clears throat> but yeah, I, I agree with that. But that being said, um, you know, essentially, uh, international law consists of essentially contract agreements between states, um, and we might not agree with the institution of statehood itself. I certainly don't. Um, I'm opposed to the entire institution of statehood because I think that it's holding us back from becoming civilized as, as, a, as a race on this planet. Um, but at the same time, uh, the, the ICJ ruling is really significant. I can't understate the significance because it essentially repudiates the entire framework of the U.S.-led so-called peace process which had always been premised on a rejection of the applicability of international law to the conflict. And in fact, you know, Israel uh, re opposed um, the, the, 
the ICJ's involvement at all, objecting that the ICJ has no jurisdiction because it's a it's a bilateral dispute between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, and the court rejected that argument on the grounds that, well, <laughs> actually, the UN has been it's it's not a bilateral issue. It's it's a international issue involving the UN um, going dating back to before Israel ever existed to the mandate era. Um, in, including the UN General Assembly's involvement in the uh, 1947 Partition Plan Resolution, Resolution 181. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting to me, essentially, that the ICJ has now not only ruled, in 2004, the ICJ had already ruled um, at the request of the General Assembly, it, it issued an advisory opinion on the legal consequences of the wall that Israel was building in the West Bank and the settlement regime in the West Bank. And it had already ruled back then that the settlement regime was illegal and the, and the construction of the wall within the West Bank was illegal, a violation of international law. So the occupation we're talking about, to answer that part of your question, um, is, is the occupation ongoing since the June 1967 war, which Israel began on the morning of June 5th, with a surprise attack on, on Egypt that destroyed most of its air force while its planes were still on the ground. Um, and that was the war in which Israel invaded and occupied the Syrian Golan Heights, the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula, uh, and the Palestinian territories of the West Bank and Gaza Strip, which at the time were being administered by Jordan and Egypt respectively. Um, so in the wake of the 1967 so-called Six-Day War, which is what Israelis call it because it was over in six days. Um, the CIA, incidentally, had, had warned Johnson that if war was going to outbreak, it would be started by Israel, which proved prescient and, and true, um, and that Israel would had such qualitative military superiority that it would defeat the combined Arab armies within a couple of weeks. <clears throat> and that turned out to be inaccurate because it only took Israel six days. Um, but otherwise, the CIA's assessment was was pretty accurate. Um, and so the occupation has been ongoing since 1967. Uh, and in the wake of the war in uh, 1967, the UN Security Council passed Resolution 242. And this resolution is at the heart of the whole deception uh, and the whole framework <clears throat> that the, the so-called peace process was grounded on. Because, and, and this is another important point about the ICJ ruling, is that it essentially, it, essentially it verifies the, my analysis that I wrote about Resolution 242 in Obstacle to Peace, um, because I was pointing out in my book that um, the there's a misinterpretation of that resolution. So Israel has its own unilateral interpretation of that resolution uh, that the U.S. accepted as the basis, as the framework for the peace process. So the, actual, the, the legitimate interpretation of Resolution 242, which we can go back to the meeting records, as I do in my book, to demonstrate this um, unquestionably, <clears throat> the, the interpretation was that Israel was required to withdraw its armed forces to the positions they held uh, before the morning of June 5th. So, uh, which were the the same as the 1949 armistice line. So sometimes they're called the 1967 lines, sometimes the 1949 armistice lines, and sometimes they're called the uh, collectively called the green line for the color with which they were drawn on the map in 1949. Um, so the the resolution required Israel to withdraw its forces to the to the armistice lines, um, in compliance with the principle of international law that the acquisition of territory by war is inadmissible. Um, and so th that's that's been the fr the basis for the what's called the two state solution in favor of which there is a, a near international consensus, Israel and the US um, being notable exceptions to the consensus view. Um, but th this has formed essentially the, the legal foundation for the two state solution, which is premised on the applicability of international law to the conflict. That's entirely different from the framework for the peace process, which, as I mentioned, is is premised or was premised. It's defunct now, thankfully, um, but was premised on the rejection of in, the applicability of international law. And so under the framework of the peace process, the people living under Israel's occupation must negotiate with their oppressors over how much of their own land they can keep 
and maybe someday potentially exercise some kind of limited autonomy over which is completely incompatible with the requirements of international law. So the ICJ ruling is really significant in that it has affirmed, essentially affirmed my analysis from, from my book um, and, and said that no, uh, the, there, there, is no there, are, there is no conditioning of the right of the Palestinian people to the exercise of self-determination. They have that right, it's an inalienable right. Israel cannot place conditions on it, um, which the, the ICJ didn't explicitly um, repudiate the framework for the peace process, but implicitly they did so, which I think is one of the, the more significant points about the ruling. Yeah. Now, so one thing that uh, sticks out here, and I'm definitely not the expert on this, but the Geneva Conventions come right around the same time as the UN Charter, and they have all of these prohibitions against, for example, moving your civilian population into conquered territory and all that separate from what the UN Charter says on that issue, right? Yeah, the, well, the, the, the fourth Geneva Convention specifically um, prohibits the transfer of an occupier's, you know, occupied, occupier's pal, uh, population into occupied territory. Um, and so that is essentially the basis of the ruling that the settlement regime is illegal. It violates the fourth Geneva Convention specifically. So I see. So it's um, yeah. not based on a chapter of the UN Charter, but the Geneva Convention. No, it's Convention based on separately. on the Fourth Geneva Convention. I see. Okay. Well, all right then. So, I well, mean, and also, and course, it's hard to argue. It, by the it's way, also, that, it is also a violation of UN resolutions because, of course, um, the UN UN Security Council resolutions are binding on on member states. Israel is a member state, uh, and Israel has perpetually violated UN Security Council resolutions. You know, again, um, you know, reiterating the requirements of Resolution 242 um, and, you know, condemning Israel's settlement act activities as a violation of international law. Um, so it, it is both. Um, but but those resolutions of the Security Council are essentially premised on the prohibition of such transfer of population um, that is contained within the Fourth Geneva Convention. So just to clarify mm -hmm. that. Yeah. OK. I mean, I guess I'm just... Part of me is a crotchy old right winger, and I just am kind of projecting onto the audience too that people they just share must share my revulsion against that baby blue flag. But I mean, the Geneva Conventions, nobody thinks that that's world government, right? That's just a contract between states about just how brutal they'll be in war or not, and whether we should have any rules governing how we fight. I think pretty much. There must be, if they know anything about them, unanimous consensus for the Geneva Conventions in the country. I'll go ahead and say, you know, when we abolish the government, we get rid of those last. You know what I mean? So, uh, yes. <laughs> anyway, it's probably dumb and beside the point. Maybe everybody's just rolling their eyes at me and taking it for granted. But to me, it's like, well, look, you could have the Geneva Conventions in a world without the UN at all. Right. And it would still right. be smart to have them, too. And then we wouldn't call that one world communism. Right. It would be a, just a contract about what's a war crime and what's not before we get started on the worst killing sprees. And so this is the deal, though, right, is after World War Two that Hitler ruined the whole Lebensraum contact uh, concept for everyone. Right. So now. <laughs> he was so brutal about stealing all that land in the East. They were like, you can't do that anymore. And yet that's what Israel is doing. Writ small here. Uh, yeah, essentially um, Israel has, and this is one of the, the points that the ICJ made, you know, and, and went on in great detail about was how Israel's um, occupation involves numerous violations of international law. So the, uh, but again, previously, previously, the Security Council and the ICJ had looked at elements of the occupation and determined that those elements of the occupation were a violation of international law, the, the, the construction of the wall, the, you know, the, the building of um, settlements within the West Bank, for example. Um, but in this case, this, this goes beyond that because the ICJ in this case has ruled that the occupation itself is a violation of international law, uh, that, that, you know, the idea of an occupation is that there is a mil military necessity and the occupying power is obligated under international law, again, the Geneva Conventions and other conventions to 
um, administer the territory for the benefit of the residents of that territory, of the inhabitants of the territory. Um, and so that, that there's all kinds of obligations that the status of an occupying power places uh, on Israel. And by the way, what does it say about, or does it say anything about, and you must withdraw as soon as possible too? Yes. Well, this is another, again, this goes back to the, the two different interpretations of UN Resolution 242. There's the legitimate mm -hmm. one, which logically follows from the explicitly stated intent of the Security Council members going through the meeting records. Mm -hmm. And then there's Israel's unilateral interpretation. You know, I was where, telling this to Bob Murphy the other day. If I have it right, you can be very specific for us, Jeremy. But mm -hmm. I was summing it up to Bob Murphy and he's like, wait, what? And if I have it right, it's basically that the Israelis' argument relies on their claim, at least, that the French version of the resolution doesn't have the article the in it. And that way, they can use that to mean they can just withdraw from any little bit of territory they were ever occupying and say that they've satisfied it. Because it doesn't say the, in other words, implying all of it. Yeah, actually, it's the, it's the English version of the of the resolution that doesn't contain the article the. Oh, really? I'm yeah. sorry. Before, I screwed that before up. The, sorry, yeah, be Bob. I'll email him right now. <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, uh, apart from that, that, that's correct. I mean, that's that's literally the argument. Um, well, there's there's two mainly, but that's maybe, one of the arguments. Maybe the French deal was. And I had it just switched around that the, the, the French, argument was, the, see, the French version does have the in it, right? Correct. Is that what it was? Correct. OK. And the French version, of course, is, is equally um, authoritative as is the English version. Sure. Um, and um, but the other point about that is, is that the absence of the article the before the phrase uh, territories occupied, you know, in the clause referencing the, the territories occupied during the 1967 war has no bearing on the extent of the withdrawal that is required. It, you know, just in terms of English grammar, it has no no bearing on, on that. So the the extent of the withdrawal is determined by what's stated in the preambulatory section of the resolution, which emphasizes, again, the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by by war. And so, and it was an explicitly, it was also, again, explicitly stated during the meeting records that uh, that the the intent of the Security Council was for Israel to fully and immediately withdraw to the armistice lines. So th this argument about the article the missing from before the, the the phrase you know territories occupied is just complete nonsense. Um, and you know we could say you, you could kind of apply the same logic to the to another clause of Resolution Two Four Two that Israel doesn't object to, which was you know the. Um, there was a clause about the need to respect, you know, states access and passage through international waterways. And it didn't say the international waterway, you know, no. that, that was with with reference to the Egyptian blockade of, you know, the, the straits there. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's so, you know, they, they just apply that logic kind of selectively. It's, it's really absurd and ridiculous. But, yeah, that is. Um, that is the, and the other, the, the second big argument. So there's the first one is just this nonsense about the article missing. And the second one was, um, uh, give me a moment. It was also related to that other, uh, oh, it, it was, it was that the, the clause, um, requiring Israel to withdraw was conditional on, uh, another part of the resolution stating that, you know, that there ought to be an end to, claims of belligerency. And so this kind of became what's called the land for peace formula. So yeah, we'll, we'll withdraw from occupied territories once you recognize the state of Israel and, you know, end all states of belligerency. But of course, you know, people living in under an occupation under the UN charter is a recognized right for people living under foreign military belligerent occupation to take up arms against their oppressors. That's an explicitly recognized right <laughs> under international law. Well, and look, even if the security force, such as Arafat's PLO, essentially surrenders and renounces violence, as long as there's a male between the age of 17 and 31 or something who's willing to swing a fist, then they can say that they don't have complete and total peace. So it's 
just an out. It's an obvious excuse. Because and they'll say that too, right? Like it doesn't matter what the official security forces say, as long as there's any violence at all. A guy with a knife. That's enough. Yeah, and, and you know, Israel's policies, um, as we've discussed before, are essentially designed to uh, provoke, you know, violent reactions from groups like Hamas, you know, Islamic Jihad, um, because because Israel depends on acts of terrorism and acts of violence against Israeli civilians um, to perpetuate its policies, because that, that's that's the whole. That's the whole means by which it claims legitimacy for its policies. Mm -hmm. But the ICJ re rejected this outright in its ruling. It, it said that you know again that there, there, there's you can't you can't prejudice the, the Palestinians' right to self determination. And going back to what I was saying earlier, you know the idea of an occupying power that an occupation is meant to be a a temporary situation, but you have here a persistent occupation, um, you know, g going for many decades. Mm -hmm. uh, so and, uh, now, Jeremy, and it, it let just, me. It, there's no, ahead. there's no security or military justification for it. Right. Well, the, yeah, I mean, they'll always make up one, but I guess what you're saying here is, yeah, it doesn't matter though. Excuses come second. You have to end the occupation now. But so then that does raise the question about, you know, <laughs> as Andrew Jackson would say, well, you made your ruling. Let's see you enforce it. And as long as they have genocide Joe up there. Or Donald Trump coming next, um, I'm sure it wouldn't be any different with Kamala Harris in charge. Then the law doesn't apply to Israel because there's nobody to make it so. If there's a world government, it's got to have the U.S. Army as its enforcement mechanism, you know, and America's yeah. on Israel's side. And so just like with the genocide ruling, the Israelis are like, man, we're not even listening to you, like, <laughs> you know. Forget you. They're not even bothering, you know, acting like the ICJ has any jurisdiction over them whatsoever. So I don't know. Yeah, I, what I, difference I think, does it make well, in the world? I think the primary significance is the impact it, it's going to have on the public discourse. Um, you know, and, and I always say this, that, you know, there's no government. You know, we, we, we want we want to see peace in the Middle East. Right. But I, I always say that there, no, there's no government that's going to get that job done. It's up to us. And there, there needs to be a paradigm shift among the American population. This is another thing I always say that, you know, if we want to see peace in the Middle Middle East between Israelis and Palestinians, step one, the prerequisite condition is an end to the U.S. policy of supporting Israel's crimes against the Palestinians. And so, you know, it, it, there needs to be this shift in perceptions and this paradigm shift. And I think this can help affect that. But speaking to your point, yeah, again, going back to, to you know, the, the whole caveat, your, your whole preface to our conversation here. Uh, so that this is the problem that the IC, number one, the ICJ has no enforcement mechanisms. It, it has no authorities to actually enforce its advisory opinions or its judgments. Um, and so the ICJ pointed this out in its in its ruling, saying that, you know, it's we were requested to issue this advisory opinion uh, by the General Assembly. And it's up for the U.N. General Assembly and the U.N. Security Council to decide how to apply its ruling um, to further the cause of peace. And of course, you know, U.N. General Assembly resolutions are, are non-binding non on member states. They're essentially reflections of the will of the international community. U.N. Security Council resolutions are binding. The problem there is the U.S. use, uh, you know, its habitual use of its veto power as one of the five permanent members um, to protect Israel from international, um, you know, censure and, and accountability. And so this is, this is a real problem here because it kind of just tosses the ball back into the court of the UN, which again, has been complicit from the start in causing the Israel-Palestine conflict um, and has, you know, despite certain rhetoric and certain, you know, resolutions, whether General Assembly or Security Council, um, to the contrary. But but really, the, the UN role has been to essentially to give its rubber stamp to the so-called peace process, even though it was grounded on this framework that was completely contrary to the actual meaning of Resolution 242 and so forth. Um, so the UN has really played a complicit role in this. Uh, but, you know, that there's, there, there is, it's kind of like there's this, the international community is kind of working against the actual UN system itself in this respect 
uh, because the international community, of course, generally favors the idea of an immediate withdrawal. It generally, you know, the view that the, the ICJ's ruling kind of reflects the, the view of the international community. Um, and it's really more that the international community is really limited within the UN organization by the the whole the whole uh, framework of the UN and, and the way it was organized where that you would have these five powers that would have this ability to exercise veto power. Um, and that's one of the fundamental problems with the UN system itself. Uh, but but another another consideration is that it also does put uh, additional pressure on the International Criminal Court, which is a separate body, which is not a UN body. It was established under a separate treaty um, to actually prosecute uh, individuals um, as a result of violating international law. Um, and it's interesting to see that finally, you know, because the, the ICC has actually had an investigation underway since 2014 that has gone essentially nowhere in all these years. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it has an ongoing investigation to investigate war crimes committed by both the Israeli government and Palestinian armed groups. And that dates back to the 2014 operation. Uh, which one was it? Uh, pillar, pillar not, not, it wasn't pillar of defense. Um, protective edge operation, protective edge <clears throat> in 2014. So after that, the IC, ICC, um, kind of got involved with this investigation. It, it just, again, it's just kind of has gone nowhere. And it was kind of surprising to me to see earlier, you know, a few months ago, um, I think it was May when the prosecutor for the ICC actually, uh, issued a statement, uh, you know, where he publicly stated that he was requesting, um, arrest warrants for uh, two Israeli leaders, and I think it was three um, uh, three Hamas officials for you know violations of international law, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Uh, and the two Israeli leaders were, of course, um, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, Defense Minister, um, gosh, his name is slipping my mind at the moment, but the uh, Israeli Defense Minister. Um, and so that that was kind of an interesting development to see, and it, it kind of it kind of reflects, I think, the the pressure on the ICC from the international community and from the public at large. And so, you know, I, I, the way I see this playing out is, again, you know, I don't I don't see that it's going to be a top down solution to, to the conflict where you know it's going to be governments getting the job done. I, I see it being public opinion and public perceptions, um, essentially. Essentially, there needs to be enough of awareness of the actual true nature of the conflict where it no longer becomes it's no longer politically feasible for the exercise for the U.S. to you know continue this policy of supporting Israel's crimes against the Palestinians. And that's step one. Um, and then, of course, you know, citizens of other countries have their own role to play in terms of their country's policies. But, you know, I'm kind of focused on on Americans and, and the U.S. government. Mm. Uh, Gallant was the name you're looking for there. But Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Hey guys, I've had a lot of great webmasters over the years, but the team at expanddesigns.com have by far been the most competent and reliable. Harley Abbott and his team have made great sites for the show and the Institute, and they keep them running well, suggesting and making improvements all along. Make a deal with expanddesigns.com for your new business or news site. They will take care of you. Use the promo code Scott and save $500. That's expanddesigns.com. Man, I wish I was in school so I could drop out and sign up for Tom Woods' Liberty Classroom instead. Tom has done such a great job on putting together a classical curriculum for everyone from junior high schoolers on up through the postgraduate level. And it's all very reasonably priced. Just make sure you click through from the link in the right margin at scotthorton.org. Tom Woods' Liberty Classroom. Real history. Real economics. Real education. Well, I guess it was just a matter of time. I drank so much coffee, I turned into some. Hey guys, check out the Scott Horton Show special blend at MundosArtisanCoffee.com. It's a blend of organically grown Ethiopian and Sumatran coffee beans. Two very different coffees combined to create a unique blend. Ethiopia is smooth and medium-bodied. Sumatra, a rich, heavy-bodied coffee. And it's got caffeine. Lots of it. Which is good for if you have to drive drunk or get up in the morning. Click through from the link in the right-hand margin at scotthorton.org to save 10% on your order. It's the Scott Horton Show blend from Mundo's Artisan Coffee. Um, 
So, but you know, the thing is, uh, well, I don't know about Kamala Harris. I mean, I'm, she's just such an empty suit. I'm sure she'll just do like in the consensus and not stray very far. Maybe say words sometimes. But Donald Trump is a real worry. I mean, Sheldon Adelson is gone, but his wife is still here. And um, I forgot if I learned this from you or who pointed this out recently. That uh, Oh, I think it was Michael Tracy actually uh, uh, pointed this out recently. That Trump actually said at a recent, somewhat recent, uh, like within the last year or so anyway, a meeting of the Republican Jewish Coalition. He pointed right at Miriam Adelson. Was like, yeah, I moved the embassy to Jerusalem because of your husband gave me all that money and he wanted it real bad. And that's why I did. I hope you're happy, lady. Which, well, I mean, why is that a big deal where the embassy is, Jeremy? Well, this also is a the U.S. embassy move was actually illegal. It's actually a violation of international law because it violated the U.N. Charter, because it violates the U.N. Security Council resolution, actually numerous numerous UN Security Council resolutions, pointing out the fact that, again, uh, the acquisition of territory by war is inadmissible. Therefore, when we talk about o the occupied territories, people need to understand that that includes all of Gaza all and all of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. So the media commonly, you know, accept Israel's framework of rejecting the applicability of international law. And so they'll refer to East Jerusalem as disputed territory, for example. Um, but, it, but it's not disputed territory. Under international law, East Jerusalem is occupied Palestinian territory, and Israel's, um, uh, uh, Israel's legislation to annex East Jerusalem is, according to UN Security Council resolutions, illegal, null, and void. And it, it's an obligation of UN member states not to recognize Israel's illegal annexation of East Jerusalem, and to that end, uh, UN member states are prohibited from moving their embassies to Jerusalem. Uh, and so <laughs> when the U.S. moved its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, that actually violated numerous U.N. Security Council resolutions. Well, I mean, um, the bottom line is what they're saying is the entire city belongs to Israel, as they say, whole and undivided and eternal and always will, which means it does not belong to the Palestinians, not any part of it, not the old city, not the east side. They'll be lucky if they get to keep that little suburb where they were talking about moving their capital to in the end of the thing. Now right. is the real point of it. The symbol there is you lose. America is on Israel's side 100% here. There is no international law when it comes to what the Likud wants. Right. And, you know, a, a, a kind of a – if you want to look at the glasses being half full with that whole uh, event, um, it, it essentially – one positive thing from it was that, it, you know, Trump essentially surrendered the the – the pretext of the U.S. as being, you know, some kind of neutral mediator, <laughs> he essentially declared, no, we're on Israel's side. <laughs> you know, so that was kind of a good thing because there, there's a lot of people, especially under the Obama administration, you know, like people had this, this delusion that, you know, he was he, the, under the Obama administration that the U.S. government was being this kind of neutral mediator. And, you know, that he was even being criticized for being too tough on Israel and stuff. Um, just like these outright delusional perceptions. Um and Trump kind of just like did away with all that. <laughs> so, you know, he got rid of that whole facade. So that was actually, you know, in my view, one of the positive outcomes of the whole yeah. thing. But uh, you know what, yeah. though, man, it could get much worse. And I don't know. I, maybe it won't be this bad. I'm not saying I predict this or whatever, but it's like it's within the realm of imagination to me that they just take the Gaza war to the West Bank and start carpet bombing the major cities there and forcing all of those people out. See if you can swim to Jordan. Good luck. And yeah. then, you know I, what I, I mean? Like, and who's going to stop them? If the, if the President of the United States is on their side and says, well, I don't know, that's one solution to the problem, and shrugs and says, go ahead, then there's really no other power on Earth going to intervene at that point or would be able to. Yeah, and well, another another point. Well, kind I don't of know about that. About Maybe that's ICC. not right. Maybe that would lead to revolution across the region, and and God knows what. But I don't know. Yeah, that's 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 easily be a World War Three situation as well. But you know, I I think uh, there's been some, you know, kind of 
interesting observations with U.S. policy under Biden um, with respect to Israel's genocide in Gaza, where, you know, the, the increasingly Biden has had to try to manage public perceptions um, and, and to distance himself from, you know, from Israel's uh, destruction, from Israel's efforts to render Gaza uninhabitable and its indiscriminate warfare and its policy of using starvation as a method of warfare. Um, and, you know, obviously Biden has suffered in the polls greatly as a result of his support for Israel's genocide. Uh, and you see him kind of trying to make, you know, public relations efforts to distance himself from it. Um, and I, I think what, one of the reasons for that is obviously it's an election year. But the, the second reason for that is, you know, the, the people in the Biden administration understand that they too could be prosecuted uh, by the ICC for violating the 1948 Genocide Convention, because the Genocide Convention doesn't just prohibit um, states from perpetrating genocide. It also prohibits them from facilitating genocide, including by render, you know, rendering support for a genocide, such as the U.S. government has been doing um, with its arms shipments, um, in addition to you know, blocking ceasefire resolutions in the, in the U.N. Security Council and so on. Um, and so, you know, U.S. officials could be also be prosecuted under international law. And so I think a, a restraint, you know, in terms of this kind of um, nightmare scenario that you're talking about with extending it to the West Bank, um, I, I think the restraint on that would be, you know, uh, the the knowledge, number, number one, you know, the, the political pressure um, based on populations perceptions of the conflict, because even, you know, even Americans among Americans, I mean, especially you look at the Democrat, Democratic Party, like they're, they're generally as is in favor, you know, of the status quo as they tend to be in both parties. Um, you know, you see among Democrats, just kind of like open rebellion against the Trump administration um, because of just the, the outright gruesomeness of Israel's actions. Um, and so there's kind of a, a, you know, that kind of does place a kind of a, a, a restraint on government's actions. And so I think we would see that, you know, kind of in global terms, that there yeah. would be a, str a restraint on Israel and the U.S. Um, that would kind of prevent it from from doing that. But, you know, again, I don't rule out the possibility, but I think there are restraints. But they all really come from, again, I just want to emphasize the point that, that they, those, those restraints really come from the bottom up. And so it's about just kind of like uh, the perceptions of people. And right. and one of the problems with U.S. policy is that, you know, Americans consent to it. They consent to this policy of U.S. support for Israel's crimes because they really don't understand the conflict. You know, we say that most of what people think they know about it just isn't true. And so it really is a matter of just like people need to become aware of the actual situation. And I think this ICJ ruling is really going to, um, you know, I think, again, one of the significant points about it is that uh, it, it can be greatly utilized. We can really use it effectively to help shift percep perceptions and, um, you know, and, and people, you know, can be awakened to the fact that, you know, is there, the idea that the Palestinians ought to negotiate with Israel um, and that they have to come to some kind of final peace settlement before Israel is obligated to withdraw is actually totally incompatible with the requirements of international law. And Israel has a legal obligation to withdraw its forces now, it fully and immediately. And so I think that's kind of one of the more um, important points to make about this ruling. Yeah. Well, OK, so but now on the public pressure front, we have a problem. I mean, I'm assuming Trump's going to win at this point because at some point they're going to have to show Kamala Harris trying to think on her feet in front of people and it's just not going to work. I don't know. Yep. He's also got problems. So it, either of them could blow it. It's, I mean, it's a dead heat, they say right now. I buy it. Um, but uh, for the I'm, sake I, of argument, presuming yeah. Trump wins, and even if he doesn't, we have a real problem with the wonderful return of the anti-war left. And we kind of lamented that they were gone because we needed an anti-war movement. But then they came back and they're burning flags and spray painting George Washington statues and whatever kind of crap and identifying the the cause of the Palestinians' rights with people who hate and want to overthrow America, which is really stupid. And, I, you know, 
it doesn't have to be the case at all, but very well could be that you have pro-Zionists just infiltrating these groups and leading them to do the stupidest things. And even if that's not true, if there's any anti-war leftists listening, if you go to rally and people are burning flags, you should start screaming FBI informant and point your finger at them and have them thrown out of there. Yeah. And because they're making you look like a dick. And that's really important. And I know that leftists just want to free move me and bring in every other thing in the world. But, uh, you know, and whatever other bad politics. But we do need the left to pressure the liberals. They need to be, you know, the Democrats. We need them, but they're just giving all their power away when they're blocking the highway and burning flags and making jackasses out of themselves. And... And totally unfairly making jackasses out of the Palestinians who don't deserve to be so humiliated by doofuses, you know? Yep. Agreed. Yep. It's really too bad. And but so it means that it's kind of all the more incumbent upon conservatives and libertarians who understand this issue well to be out there and show people that you don't have to be one of these protesting leftists in order to see what's going on here. And so... You're definitely yeah, I think serving the, a very the important protests role are in that important. Case. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, they ought to be carried out w with sense and and reason and uh, an understanding of how their behavior is perceived by everyone else. It's funny, you know. <laughs> it'd be funny to think of Trump like just overdoing it on purpose to try to create a backlash against it or something. I think Obama did it at one point. Like, if you remember when. Uh, the only people in Washington that wanted him to bomb Syria in August of 2013 was just like Winep, <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. the Center for Security Policy. And, you know, and like there was nobody but the Israel lobby that wanted that war. And Obama was like, even at one point, because I remember making fun of him on Twitter about it, even at one point was like, uh, I think I got this from Phil Weiss, was calling them. Like, had the White House calling Israel lobby groups and saying, I really need y'all's help. You should really stick your neck out and declare how much you want this war. And then he didn't do it, you know, just to make them look like jerks. That's what it kind of looked like to me. I don't think Trump is, I mean, he is that mean, but he, I don't think he'd do that to them, unfortunately, to the lobby. But I'd sure like to see him. And, and if anybody could do it, it would be him to just flip flop and be like, actually, I'm sick of y'all's bullshit. I remember the way you endorsed Biden, you know, although he already declared he's over that. I don't know if you saw that. Somebody asked him and and he said that, uh, you know, he had a great meeting with Netanyahu and and that was no big deal at all and whatever. So I don't know. Yeah, we hey, needed you know, Ron Paul and we got this clown. Uh, just just something that just kind of popped into my head that I, I forgot to mention so far. But another really, really important point about the ICJ ruling Um is that it, it addressed, you know, again, it, it, it declared that the occupation itself was a violation of international law. But again, one of the elements of the occupation is Israel's discriminatory legislation and, and policies and practices in, in the West Bank and, and in Gaza. Um, and it's a it really also significant thing that, as you know, um, in prior years, numerous international human rights organizations, including Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, um, Israeli human rights organizations um, like uh, Beth Salem and Gisha have all um, issued papers and, and statements uh, declaring uh, Israel's occupation regime to constitute the crime of apartheid. And interestingly, uh, the ICJ pointed out that uh, these policies, the, the discriminatory nature of Israel's policies and practices under its occupation do violate uh, international conventions. And they specifically mentioned uh, Article 3 of what's called the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. And that article um, specifically mentions, specifically uses the, the label of apartheid um, to describe uh, you know, these types of discriminatory practices. So although the ICJ didn't explicitly describe Israel's um, occupation regime as an, as constituting the crime of apartheid, it implicitly did so, which is another kind of interesting point that I think is uh, worth, worth emphasizing. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's also very telling that when people deny that Israel's an apartheid state, they'll many times exclude the occupation. 
Just be like, nah, come on. Palestinian citizens of Israel don't have it that bad. Yeah, there's members of Knesset that are yeah. Arabs. It's like, well, actually, they're sort of second class citizens treated like blacks in the old South, you know, before the Voting Rights Act. But uh, then again, um, you know, that's really not the point. We're talking about the five million people living under military occupation. What right. kind of obfuscation is that? Right. And, and to that point, I mean, even even if we just even if we do accept that narrow framework, because look, let's let's look at that more carefully. So. Um, there's actually a law on the books um, in Israel that you know, to be able to part to, to be able to run for for the Knesset, Israel's legislature, that um, you know your your party has to accept um, Israel as the uh, as the basically as the state of the Jewish people. And if you don't accept that, like if if you believe that all citizens ought to be treated equally and have you know, an equal right to self-determination, um, which of course, you know, the Jewish nation state law explicitly states that Israel is, that, that the right to self-determination is a right exclusive to Jews in the territory under Israel's control and so on. Uh, and so there's kind of a precondition for, for someone to be able to even run for the Knesset that they, they have to essentially accept, you know, for an Arab is to run, they have to accept their status as a second class citizen as a precondition for even participating in elections. And so, you know, they, you know, the people who make that argument that you just mentioned, you know, they, they, don't, they don't like to talk about those types of things. Yeah. I, isn't it funny how in America, separation of church and state is one of the most important things to everyone. I mean, there are some sects who imagine that at some point they'll be the ones to get to force everybody to be a Methodist or something like that. But nah, -uh. you know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, everybody wants that ever since the 13 colonies and everybody had all these different types of Protestantism, basically, you know, at the very start. And so the idea that America be so much behind this ethno-religious state that breaks things down in such a way. I mean, the nation state law, is that what you're referring to? Because there are a bunch of different aspects to it. Yeah. The, but the, the, Well, uh, the, the two, I mentioned two laws there, and, and I was talking about a different law, but in, in the middle of that discussion, I, I, I referenced, thought so. I yeah, yeah because, the 2018 okay, go ahead, go ahead. nation state law was the one that explicitly de defines uh, self-determination as a right exclusive to Jews. Yeah. Um, I mean, think about the outrage, even on the right, if they passed a law like that in America saying, oh, yeah. If, I mean, even among Christians, well, what kind? You going to make all the kids pray in school? The Baptist yeah. prayer or the Methodist prayer or the Presbyterian prayer or the Catholic one? <laughs> right? Yeah. Or, oh, yeah. I know what we should do. We should all fight about it instead of just being free and leaving each other alone on those issues. Um, I know we'll just make it where, like in Ohio, Catholics don't have any rights anymore. Or in Pennsylvania, the Protestants or what? I mean, it would be insane to think of implementing any kind of Israeli oriented type situation in the United States. It sounds just absurd for me to even mention it. It's completely crazy. It, it is completely crazy. And, and what what is astonishing to me is how so many Americans delude themselves into thinking that Israel is some kind of democracy, um, you know, that it has democratic government when the whole country is founded in the most profound rejection of the right of the land's indigenous inhabitants to self-determination. I mean, the entire mandate, the, the, the entire British um, belligerent occupation of Palestine after World War I, um, the whole purpose of it, first of all, the mandate was was drafted by Zionists themselves for the benefit of the Zionists to, to implement the Zionist project. The mandate for Palestine violated the League of Covenants own, own charter. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole purpose of, of Britain's belligerent occupation was to prevent the Palestinians from being able to exercise their right to self-determination by declaring their own independent state and establishing their own their own independent state. And, you know, it was the Arabs proposal back then during the mandate. That what they were proposing was let's have, a, you know, we're, we'd like to see an in, independent state of Palestine as promised to us by Britain uh, in exchange. You know, that's the Britain promised the Arabs, uh, you know, you support our war effort against the, the Ottomans and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll help you gain your independence from Ottoman rule. And so, you know, Arabs were on, on the side of Britain 
uh, including Palestinians. You know, when, when Britain conquered Jerusalem, there were, there were Arab fighters fighting alongside the British forces. Um, and, and again, so the whole purpose of Britain's occupation was to prevent the, to, to be renege on that promise and to prevent the Palestinians from being able to exercise the right to self-determination. Um, and the Arabs were proposing, you know, a single independent state with a constitution, um, with democratic government, uh, with a constitution, you know, gu guaranteeing, protecting the rights of the minorities, which of course meant Jews, because Jews were still the minority. Um, and, and of course, is the Zionists rejected that. The Zionists literally rejected them, the democratic solution um, in favor of the means by which Israel was actually ultimately established. It wasn't established by the UN. That's a myth. It's completely false. UN Resolution 181, the Partition Plan Resolution, was never implemented. Israel was established uh, by ethnically cleansing most of the, the Arab population from their homes in Palestine. So it was established through force and violence and ethnic cleansing, a crime against humanity. Um, and, you know, the, the people... So to describe Israel as a democracy, when you know it exists as this apartheid regime founded in the most profound rejection of democratic principles that you can imagine, it's just it's really delusional. And yet, so many Americans and the biggest problem, you know, here's the elephant in the room, Scott, is Christian Zionists, of course. You know, we hear a lot about the Israel lobby, but um, not so much about. The, the the influence of Christian Zionism. And so, you know, like APAC money, I, I put it this way, APAC money isn't required to explain, you know, lawmakers, congressional um, congresspersons positions on, on Israel when they are themselves ideologically Zionist, right? And that that's another huge problem. And of course, the Republican Party tends to pander greatly to the uh, to the Christian Zionists, including Trump. They all do. Um, and that that's another really big problem. Um, and like you, it's I, millions I, of uh, votes, millions yeah. of votes. And, and my, my my assumption, like you, is that Trump is going to win the election. Uh, I mean, he's the most famous guy in the world. It's his to lose anyway. That's for sure. You know, um, but on the other hand, all the reasons that Democrats had to stay home for Biden are basically over. Right. He's genocide. Joe, she's not genocide. Kamala. And they're not going to hang this on her. She's going to get away with, you know, not having that responsibility for his Gaza war. Yeah. Um, and for the rest of it, whatever he did wrong, inflation, this, that, the other thing, she's just the vice president. And nobody thinks that she's Dick Cheney. Like when we ask who's really running things up there, nobody thinks that it's Kamala Harris <laughs> and her staff, right? Like it's yep. not. It hasn't been. So, um She's, in their mind, not guilty of everything, and particularly the age thing. And now who's the old man? It's funny that the Republicans, they push that, you know, uh, demented old man thing, which they're completely right about. But they weren't planning for the day after. Now he's twice as old as her. And so now who's the doddering old fool and who can walk up and down stairs fast and whatever? You know what I mean? As far as all that stuff goes. I saw Dave kind of downplaying that, like, that doesn't mean much, but I think it means a lot. In other words, for the Democrats, oh, good, someone to support. And she's basically a blank slate. She doesn't have, like, all that mean old Hillary Clinton baggage. She's like, whatever they want to believe in. And she's got time to stay vague enough for them to believe in her. She ain't Obama, but she'll do for them, I think, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, that, you know, that's kind of my perception of, of Biden's um, running for president yeah, after Obama was, right. you know, he was it, was, it was an extension of the Obama administration because he was the VP under Obama. And it's, Washington it's kind of Times like, said they're today, still just trying to extend the Obama administration as far as I can tell. Yeah. I mean, the Washington Times said today that whatever, Nate Silver, or one of these guys with the, one of these statisticians was saying, looks to them right now, she's going to win the popular vote, but he's going to win the Electoral College. That's how it's breaking down as of the 1st of August here, which I could, in other words, She's not going down in smoke and flames. She is a reason for Democrats to rally. And they've taken to it at least so far. Now, maybe she'll just completely stumble over herself and make a jackass out of herself for the next few weeks straight. But I think they'll probably keep her in the basement more or less, you know, or like keep her on script. Yeah. So yeah. tell her to stop making up new cliches. They don't work well. <laughs> you know? Um, the Palestinians, unburdened by what Israel has been. There's one. I'll buy into that. 
Um, anyway, all right, I should let you go. Thank you so much for your great insight here. I also want to make sure that people uh, take a look at your column archive at the Libertarian Institute. You got a bunch of great stuff there, including this one, um, which is called If Israel's Apologists Insist That From the River to the Sea is Genocidal. Well, I'm going to direct your attention to some things here lately. And then, of course, <laughs> this one is called ICJ declares Israel's occupation illegal. And that is, uh, oh, this one's actually running on the blog at the Institute. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Appreciate you, man. Hey, it's great talking to you again. Thanks for having me on. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA, APSradio.com, antiwar.com, scotthorton.org, and libertarianinstitute.org.